Welcome to the Microsystem Seminar Series. Um, as you know, we have these seminars once a month uh, by some of the leading researchers in the field. And we're trying to cover both the physical as well as the theoretical aspect of the microsystems. Um, today's speaker uh, is our colleague, Professor John Hart from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, John received his uh, PhD and master's degree from MIT, and then he joined Michigan shortly after that on faculty in mechanical engineering department. John's work is uh, truly fascinating, and you get to see what he's doing. He's the recipient of the 2006 MIT Centurio Prize that uh, I was actually impressed to know that he was the first one who received this, knowing Professor Steve Centurio. And uh, he also received a number of awards since he moved to Michigan, including the DARPA Young Faculty Award and twice the R&D Awards in 2008 and 2009, and many other prestigious awards, including the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Program Award. Um, John is going to talk about the exciting research that uh, he's currently conducting in this group, so we don't care to do Thank you very much for the introduction. It's uh, excellent to be here. Sorry, I forgot to put on the microphone. I'll do that now. I'll talk about uh, manufacturing, or maybe the most difficult word is growth of carbon nanotubes, uh, in a general context of nanotube films, and in a specific context of making nanotube uh, microstructures that uh, could be possibly useful for applications of microsystems. And uh, one of the things that uh, happens when you're an assistant professor, I learned quickly, is that you get to spend you know, long times alone in your office working on things like proposals. And during that time, I like to listen to music. And uh, about 18 months ago, I was struck when one of my favorite bands called Muse, they're from England, came up with a new album, and I saw it, and I immediately saw a carbon nanotube on the cover. <laughs> and it looks like there's a man walking down the center of a multi-wall nanotube, multi-wall nanotube there. Not only is he in the center of a nanotube, but at the end, there's the earth, which looks like the catalyst particle that's <laughs> used to grow carbon nanotubes. So I felt very inspired, and even further inspired, when the title of the album is The Resistance, which makes me think about the fight that we all, uh, we all fight to understand the growth mechanism and how to make nanotubes better. There are clearly a lot of defects in the walls of the nanotubes here. Um, but nanotubes can come in different varieties. Typically, they're distinguished whether they're single-walled or multi-walled. Single-walled nanotubes are about one nanometer in diameter. Uh, can be smaller or bigger. And multi-walled nanotubes you know, look like uh, cylindrical onions and can be up to tens of, of walls across. And you know, nanotubes are one of the allotropes or structural forms of carbon uh, before the nanotube uh, was uh, made popular came the fullerene discovered in 1985 by Richard Smalley and his colleagues, uh, or C60. And uh, we're also familiar, of course, with diamond and graphite, sort of the limiting uh, allotropes in terms of their bonding configuration. And certainly there's been even more interest in nanotubes that, uh, in, uh, in graphene uh, lately because of the Nobel Prize given earlier this year. In fact, it's possible to exfoliate single layers of graphite from a uh, simple pencil. So certainly there's a lot of exploration possible across this space of carbon nanomaterials. And even within the world of nanotubes, there are a lot of applications that to me depend on how the nanotubes are made and organized. So on this chart, I've laid out uh, some applications that researchers across industry and the world are working on for nanotubes. And uh, to me, it depends on the number of nanotubes you need and how they're configured. For example, there are many interesting devices that have been demonstrated, such as you know, uh, electronic uh, circuit elements, uh, individual transistors, or uh, micro and nano MEMS devices such as pressure sensors where you just need one nanotube but you need to place it exactly where you or where you want to make it functional in the device. And then the other limit, it's possible to make bulk plastics conductive or reinforce them uh, mechanically by making nanotubes in bulk powders and dispersing them in plastic. And uh, these kinds of materials, in fact, bulk production of nanotubes is a commercial product today. About 300 tons of multi-wall carbon nanotubes are made in powders every year, and they're used largely as additives to make plastics conductive for electrostatic discharge, 
and used it in some uh, composite materials. And there's a lot of unexplored territory in making nanotubes in more organized configurations. For example, some startup companies are working on spinning nanotubes into yarns and sheets for applications that might replace carbon fiber and maybe also offer enhanced electrical properties for things like lightweight wiring for aircraft. There's also significant development in nanotube-based thin films for sensors and for transparent electrodes, for example, to uh, possibly replace uh, uh, conductive oxides that are used in, 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 in touchscreens uh, displays, as well as what I'll talk about today, and that is manufacturing of vertically aligned nanotubes, what we call forests, for applications that can hopefully take advantage of the properties of carbon nanotubes in this one direction where all the nanotubes are aligned. And to me, there is, from a manufacturing point of view, there's a need to uh, you know, kind of both grow and assemble the nanotubes simultaneously and understand how to organize them in ways that can take advantage of their collective properties. So, you know, in a manufacturing plant, you can make large quantities of nanotube powders. This guy in Japan is holding a bag uh, full of only 100 grams of multiple nanotubes, but really the, uh, the, the production challenge is to organize the nanotubes simultaneously during growth. And there are many uh, potential applications of these vertically aligned nanotube forests. And my talk will focus more on the synthesis and, 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 and processing techniques rather than uh, specific applications. But to give you a general overview, there's interest in using carbon nanotube forests as filtration membranes, for example, filtering uh, molecules uh, and take advantage of the uh, hydrophobic interactions between uh, fluids and nanotubes by passing liquids through, say, suspended forests like so. Uh, there's also work using nanotube forests to reinforce composites, for example, laying a thin nanotube forest between consecutive laminates and composite materials and using the mechanical strength to impart enhanced, enhanced toughness to the laminate. And there's also work on using the thermal conductivity of nanotubes as enhanced thermal interfaces, as well as uh, making nanotube-based dry adhesives that can take advantage of the large contact area, as well as the mechanical compliance to get uh, a high adhesion and stiction between the synthetic surface and, and the substrate. All of these applications require understanding of sort of the self-assembly mechanism of a carbon nanotube forest, and really making well-aligned uniform films by that method. And whether the nanotubes are made you know, in a, in a big gas phase reactor where the catalyst is floating around or with the catalyst resident on a substrate, uh, the typical mechanism is quite similar, and that's uh, production of the nanotubes by a chemical vapor deposition where you take a gas phase carbon source and you use a nanoscale metal particle as what's called the catalyst to convert the carbon from the gas phase to the solid phase. So semantically, it could be argued whether or not this metal is actually a catalyst, but practically what's going on is the uh, carbon from the gas phase is dissociating at uh, or on the surface of the catalyst, and by diffusion uh, on or through the catalyst, you end up precipitating solid carbon and growing the nanotube. Initially, the catalyst becomes supersaturated with carbon in the bulk or on the surface, the cap of the nanotube forms, and then it lifts off. So there's a geometric requirement as well as kind of a thermodynamic requirement for growing a nanotube. And I'll show you a movie of an individual uh, carbon nanotube or nanofiber growing taken uh, six years ago in the TEM uh, in this paper. And here the catalyst particle is shown there. And the catalyst particle is lifting off the substrate uh, rather than staying resident, the difference between what's called base growth versus tip growth. But you can see that the catalyst particle is essentially a little reactor that's leaving the nanotube behind. And while it's possible to place one catalyst particle to grow a nanotube in a particular location, what we do to make forests is we place large numbers of catalyst particles on the substrate. And we do this by starting with a silicon wafer substrate and depositing, for example, a thin film of iron, one, one or two nanometers, uh, by sputtering or electron beam evaporation. And when we heat the substrate in a mixture of hydrogen and helium, the, the iron de-wets agglomerates to form nanoparticles. And then when we introduce a hydrocarbon source to the furnace, uh, the nanotubes start growing. And when you have a sufficiently high density of nanotubes to kind of touch one another during the initial stages of the growth process, it's sort of a combined mechanical and chemical process that causes the nanotubes to organize into the forest. We'll see some more detailed images later of how this structure varies uh, during the growth process, but suffice it to say, having a high density of growing nanotubes causes the forest to grow vertically. And if you take an AFM image, atomic force microscope, 
of the iron film before and after this annealing process, you can see clearly we transformed this relatively flat film into a population of particles, and, and hopefully most of those particles will convert themselves into nanotubes or be those small-scale reactors for producing an individual nanotube. So in the lab, we have taken the approach to build small CD systems to grow nanotubes on small pieces of silicon wafers. And, uh, and we can classify uh, those two systems as what we call a hot wall furnace or a tube furnace, where we have a quartz glass tube, which is externally heated, just a $2,000 clamshell furnace from Thermo Fisher Scientific. And we build manifolds of mass flow controllers to mix the gases we use for the different stages of the process. Uh, another type of system is what one might call a cold wall system, where instead of heating the furnace from the outside, uh, we're heating the substrate directly, or specifically we're heating a platform on which our little piece of silicon substrate rests. And uh, again, a very home-built system, but one that was useful to, for example, rapidly control the temperature much faster than is typically done in a tube furnace, and use simple imaging or you know, optical reflectometry methods to measure the height of the nanotube forest versus time. So you get a little bit more information about the process. And this lets us do other things such as heat the gas separately from heating the substrate. And what we found is that the thermal decomposition or thermal rearrangement of the hydrocarbon mixture that's typically used in nanotube growth processes is in fact quite essential to uh, maintaining an efficient growth process. And it hadn't been known what the most efficient precursors to nanotubes are. Uh, not only how to grow films efficiently, but how you might think about effectively scaling up the process chemically. So if you take a picture of this uh, heated substrate as a nanotube forest is growing, we're growing a very tall one. This is what it looks like. Uh, you can see the substrate is resistively heated here. We're looking through the, the wall of the quartz tube furnace. And, and this is under a condition where we grow the nanotube forest to a few millimeters tall. So we'll pass around a similar sample. Uh, this is about 20 billion, uh, these are multi-walled nanotubes of 10 nanometers diameter uh, in a square centimeter, but it's 99% air. One, uh, one, one advantage and limitation, you'll see both sides of the coin later on, is that this is a very low density material. It relates to the density of the catalyst particles and how the nanotubes self-organize. I think even if we increase that density, there would be a physical limit of 5 or 10% based on the stability of the particles on the substrate. And if we took a video of the forest growing, uh, you could see it, you know, because it's millimeter scale, uh, growing right before your eyes. It seems like the video is not loading, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass on. But you would see the film thicken uh, slowly, and the kind of black portion would appear between these two substrates. If we look at the sidewall with the scanning electron microscope, you see the general vertical alignment of the nanotubes. It consists of you know, locally isolated nanotubes as well as bundled nanotubes held together sterically and by Van der Waals forces. Uh, and, and to me, this picture can speak many words because it can tell us about the real uh, kind of dynamic process that happens as the nanotubes are whizzing by. Uh, if, if one nanotube was one foot in diameter like a regular tree in the forest, uh, the tubes would be growing at about 500 miles an hour. Maybe from a molecular scale, that's still a slow process, but it's an incredibly dynamic process to me when you consider that, that this, this forest contains a distribution of diameters, maybe 10 plus or minus 2 nanometers for a standard deviation, and different nanotubes grow at different rates. And that means that the tubes are pulling and pushing on each other as they're growing, and not only the space, but also the dynamics can lead to this general tortuosity of the material. By changing the thickness of the catalyst material and the conditions of the annealing process that forms nanoparticles, it's uh, routinely possible for us to control the diameter of the nanotubes in the forest. So we can go, for example, from nanotubes which have an average of two or three walls up to uh, nanotubes that have a, a greater number of walls, maybe 10 walls there. It's a challenge to make vertically aligned nanotubes that uh, are single walled and very small diameter for two reasons in my view. One, because it's much more difficult to stabilize very small catalyst particles because the catalyst likes to migrate, particles want to ripen. And also mechanically in terms of this self-organization, if you think of how the stiffness of the nanotube scales with diameter, uh, single wall nanotubes are a lot flimsier and therefore experience greater thermal vibration. So the process windows for growing these garden variety multi wall nanotube forests, 8 or 10 nanometers diameter, are much broader than smaller diameter tubes. We're trying to make progress on all fronts. One important question in this general area of thermal uh, CBD of nanotubes is what are the efficient precursors? What carbon gases 
uh, actually make the nanotube. If you insert uh, ethylene and hydrogen inside the furnace, particularly one of the hot wall tube furnaces, uh, if you use a, a mass spec to sniff the output, you see that you've formed a polydispersed mixture of hydrocarbons, everything from the starting product to large polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. In fact, similar things that are formed uh, as in cigarette smoke. So using simple methods of our locally heated furnace uh, combined with introducing different carbon sources and measuring the height of the nanotube forest versus time using a simple laser sensor, uh, we were able to realize that certain hydrocarbons are more efficient than others to grow these nanotube forests. Particularly if we add, uh, in addition to the input uh, mixture of ethylene and hydrogen, a small amount of an alkyne, a triple bonded hydrocarbon, uh, we can get much faster growth. And the plot here shows the height of the nanotube forest versus time. And for example, if we add a small amount of acetylene or methyl acetylene or vinyl acetylene, we can grow the nanotube forest to half to one and a half to two millimeters in a matter of 10 minutes or so. Whereas if we add other molecules, which uh, in, in data not shown here, were shown to be correlated to the growth rate of the nanotube forest as measured at the output of the furnace, we don't get such enhancement. So adding a mixture of an alkyne, an alkene, a triple bonded carbon, and a double bonded carbon to the carbon source seems to be a recipe for efficient growth of these vertically lined nanotubes and perhaps nanotubes in general. And one important attribute of the, the kinetics here, and you know, people, uh, it's possible to sort of approximate the kinetics of the reaction for forest growth as being the height versus time. So if you, if you take the assumption that that's an effective measure of kinetics, and then try to relate this relationship of height versus time to, say, a, a decay limited or a fusion limited model, that sort of quote fits. But there's, there's a problem, and that problem is this abrupt termination of growth. Growth is proceeding in a slightly sublinear fashion, and all of a sudden something happens. The forest stops growing suddenly. The one I showed you before, you know, five millimeters tall on the hot substrate, that was growing happily until all of a sudden it stopped at four to five millimeters tall. The same thing is true for the one I passed around. So we wanted to understand what you know, limits the height of, of these forests, of these films. Why shouldn't, isn't it possible for nanotubes to stop to grow forever. And you could say if you're growing one, well, when the catalyst stops, you know, that's when growth stops. But if you're growing a whole bunch, what is the collective mechanism of growth termination? And through uh, a series of analyses using microscopy and using a morphological analysis using X-ray scattering, what we found is that inside this black box of the growing nanotube forest, as the growth proceeds, the density of actively growing nanotubes is actually changing. And so, recall at the start of the process, the nanotubes self-organized to form this vertical forest. And as a result of that, the top of the forest actually has uh, a tangled crust on top. So there's a tangled film that rides on the top of the forest. And then after that crust, which may only be a micron tall, the nanotubes are pretty vertically aligned. And, and the catalyst is at the bottom, pushing the forest up. And this process of steady growth with a constant density of nanotubes depending on the growth conditions, continues for maybe about half of the final height. And then the density of nanotubes actually starts decreasing. However, if you're looking at the height of the forest versus time, there's very little change in the apparent growth kinetics. And the reason why growth stops in the end is perhaps a simple one, that eventually the density of nanotubes that are still growing is so low that they cannot support one another. You cannot maintain this vertically aligned structure to keep the forest growing. And that is what we believe is responsible for this abrupt termination. Uh, the termination of growth that is also witnessed by a loss of alignment of the nanotubes at the base of the forest. So if you look at the bottom of the forest, of this one millimeter tall forest or so, within the last, say, 10 microns from the substrate, the tubes go from being fairly well aligned to being uh, heavily disordered. And then there's this abrupt transition between those two morphologies that is a signature of self-termination. And this is happening because the individual catalyst particles are dying. There's a population-based distribution of lifetimes, but it's the collective interaction among the tubes growing that causes the film to stop, uh, stop increasing in height. And if we measure the mass of films grown for different times, then if you know the diameter of the nanotubes on average, you can work out the number density of nanotubes versus position. And this is just done you know, with a series of five experiments 
but you can see that on the vertical axis here, for the first 10 minutes of growth or so, the density of nanotube was constant, and then we entered a stage where the density rapidly decayed and reached what we believe to be a critical value uh, to terminate the forest growth process. And the further analysis has worked out to be about 10% uh, of the initial density. But you know, overall, I'd like to say that it's you know, routine for us to grow these nanotube forests in the lab, uh, which it is, but there's still a lot of fluctuations in the process. Nanotube growth is honestly sometimes quite finicky. And if you do a large number of experiments under these you know, sort of ambient you know, uh, uh, home-built lab system conditions, uh, you reveal that there are significant process variations. And I think these variations are, well, are connected in some parts to what we understand about this collective growth mechanism. The, the density of the forest is determined by how the nanotubes self-organize. So the number of catalyst particles that actually grow nanotubes can be very sensitive to, say, trace contaminants in the atmosphere. And that can affect the density of the forest. And then the rate at which the catalyst particles die can also uh, change based on fluctuations in the process. And it can be, for example, you know, how clean is someone's furnace tube, or what someone's exact process for positioning the samples in the furnace. And this became an issue of, of profound frustration to a lot of us in the lab when different people get different results doing exactly the same thing. So in the past year, we committed to a study where we would try to repeat exactly the same growth recipe, the same furnace, the same tube, the same wafer. We were tracking the position of the chip that we cut out of the wafer, but everything documented. And then we ended up with this is 280 samples, 70 runs of four samples each, two runs per week, so it's less than a year. And we use the same growth time, and we see that there's actually a fairly broad distribution in the, the, the final height of the film. The average height of the film in 10 minutes is about 0.4 millimeters, but there's a lot of fluctuation. And there's also a lot of fluctuation in the density. So we're now undertaking an effort to improve the consistency and repeatability of this growth process. And one thing that we found is that even though the exposure of the catalyst to ambient humidity, whether we kept it in the lab drawer or kept it in the desiccator, wasn't a factor, there seems to be a profound correlation between the height of the forest we grow uh, and the humidity that's measured in the lab, just using a small sensor. We think what's happening is that, that, um, that the water that absorbs to the inside of the furnace tubes as we are storing them is affecting the performance of the catalyst during the process. It would run into this problem if we had the chamber that we always kept pumped down, but given the number of experiments we're doing and the number of systems we have, uh, we were running into this problem. And so here you see the height of the forest grown in different runs, so four samples per run, uh, plotted against the relative humidity measured in the lab, and uh, it's actually better when it's drier. So growth is better in the winter than it is in the summer. You see this general downward trend in humidity with this upward trend in the growth result. And there are evenly some, even some kind of mirrored events. You could say that fluctuations such as this, you know, this uptick in growth correlate with this downtick in humidity and then opposite and so on. So I'm telling you this maybe to convey you know, how we're trying to solve some of the consistency problems that really for the second part of the talk will seem like you know, we need to tackle them for this to become a bread and butter fabrication process for ourselves. And on account of the initiative of a, of a, of a new PhD student who joined my group uh, in the fall, uh, we've undertaken an effort to build an automated small scale CBD firm. So this was entirely his idea. and He led a team in a mechatronics class in the fall and we call it the Robo Furnace. And what this will let us do is keep the furnace a tube and a magazine in an entirely sealed atmosphere and pre-queue up to 15, or in this, I guess 12 runs uh, of, of nanotube growth. So each person can load their chips in a position in one of these magazines. And when the run is done, a gate valve will open up here, the magazine will index, and an arm that's sealed in a bellows will come in and it will take the sample out of the furnace and remove it and lay it on the magazine and do the next one. And, uh, the system is not working yet, but it's pretty much built, and you can see a picture of it. And another thing that we'll be able to do is, is, is for some, uh, especially for making microstructures that you'll see later, the heating and cooling rate is also important. So being able to not only you know, control the temperature program in the furnace, but also move the furnace to heat and cool the system will be very useful to us. And 
if, for example, the growth rate fluctuates, then it might be useful for us to not control time, but to control height. And so we have a camera system that looks down at the end of the tube. There's a, there's a flat end window here, and there's a ring light at the end, and we can uh, measure the height of the forest within a resolution of five or 10 microns. So we can get data in real time and also stop the process on and die. So you know, that's sort of the current status of our, our understanding of how to make these films you know, maybe as one might, you know, make an oxide film or a nitride film in a microfabrication process. And now I'll, I'll switch to uh, discussing uh, the possibility of using nanotubes as a uh, nanotube forest as possibly a new material in MEMS and microsystems. And that requires controlled synthesis as well as ways to manipulate and integrate the nanotube forests in particular device compatible configurations. So the first step to doing that is simply growing nanotube forests from pattern catalysts. Uh, previously, we put the catalyst everywhere. Uh, if you pattern a photoresist on your silicon wafer prior to deposition of the catalyst by, by evaporation or sputtering, then if you lift off the photoresist, of course, the catalyst only remains in the areas you dictate, and you can grow vertical microstructures. So each of these structures is a nanotube forest containing you know, thousands to millions or more nanotubes, and uh, the geometries may be quite similar to what you see you know, if you do deep reactive ion etching of silicon or if you do you know, deep exposure of SUA. However, this is in principle you know, a combination of top-down and bottom-up processing. You're growing the nanotubes vertically. And in fact, you can pretty much grow any shape. We had a lot of fun a couple years ago when we decided to pattern faces of the, of the president-elect. Uh, it might be the most famous thing we will ever do. It shows that you can get you know, fairly curvy shapes and straight sidewalls by growing nanotubes. Parts. So a challenge and an opportunity is presented both if we look back at this picture, the sidewall of the forest. So this is a material that you know consists of these well-aligned nanostructures. So you could say, well, it has a lot of accessible surface area. If you could do things on the sidewalls of the nanotubes, the nanotubes are mechanically robust and electrically conductive, so that could create some opportunities. But there is a, a very important problem relating from the low density of the nanotube forest. Because this is you know, 99 or 95% air, the best we can do, if you take the forest and expose it to a photoresist or to a liquid, the capillary forces pretty much destroy the morphology of your structures. So if we want to turn that problem into an opportunity, uh, we can think about how we can use this aligned fibrous network in a controlled fashion, basically densify the nanotubes using capillary forces. And this motivation comes from a uh, very elegant work uh, from 2004, which studied the mechanics of elastocapillary aggregation of fibers. And that means the balance between elastic and capillary forces that occurs, for example, when you withdraw a paintbrush from a paint can, or you withdraw your hair you know, from the swimming pool. And uh, in this elegant experiment where they had some long, slender filaments uh, equally spaced at this top, uh, top picture here. They withdrew the filaments from the liquid, and you can see that they hierarchically bundled. And this principle of using liquids to you know, densify things is long, a, it was identified as a problem in fabrication of thin photoresist features in Japan in the early 90s. And before we started, others making nanotube forests had in fact shown that capillary forces can be used to densify nanotubes. Uh, but what they did is they took their nanotube pattern, uh, either lithographically fabricated pillars or non-pattern forests, and they just dipped it in the liquid, and they withdrew it. And this, for example, let a cylindrical feature like so become this you know, uh, volcano-like structure, or a non-pattern forest become this foam, where this is kind of a random analogy to this very ordered example of the left. The balance between the elastic and capillary forces is causing the nanotube forest to dry up and form this cellular foam structure. So upon you know, looking at this, this, this previous work and thinking about the problem we had in integrating nanotubes in, in, in microfabrication, we took a slightly different approach in two ways. Uh, we did capillary densification of our nanotube pillars, uh, not by immersing the nanotube substrate in the liquid, but by condensing the liquid onto the substrate and, and, and condensing just a small amount of liquid. And we thought that might be important because when you dip something in a liquid, you know, the, the liquid surface as the substrate is immersed and, with, uh, immersed and withdrawn can exert lateral forces on the structure. So it can knock small things over, or if you have it, the, the substrate flooded the liquid, it can like pull 
features together. But if we condense the liquid onto the substrate, then if the nanotube forest likes the liquid we use, typically a solvent like acetone or isopropanol, then each feature will wick the liquid into it, and then it can kind of be isolated, and it can form itself on its own. So that's, that's one important thing. The other thing we looked at after we did the first step was how the way the nanotube forest, it's each little, each little pillar or little group, uh, changes shape according to the, the, the catalyst pattern we use. So two examples here. One, if you have a thin ring of nanotubes, then uh, based on the balance of elastic and capillary forces, the, 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 the wall will densify so it will get thinner, and it will slope inward toward the top. So that's kind of one basic building block. Another building block we found is, is a semicircle, so an asymmetric structure. And in fact, what happens, I'll explain a little bit, is the structure actually tilts or bends to the side. So now we've converted a vertical structure to a tilted structure. And it's traditionally maybe a bit more difficult to make tilted structures in microfabrication. And initially, the way we did this capillary forming or condensation densification was was pretty crude. We took a, bo a beaker, a large, wide beaker of boiling solvent inside the fume hood, and we took a, a chip containing the, the nanotube pillars and just held it over the beaker to condense liquid because this remains cooler, the vapor is hot, for a few seconds, and then took it away, flipped it over, and after evaporated it and it. And pretty much all the pictures I'll show you today are from this method, although now we've built a low pressure chamber that lets us control the temperature and pressure of the solvent. It's much more consistent. So a first example of a shape transformation by densification is that this is one microfeature that consists of two rings of nanotube forest, and before the densification process they're vertical, and after the densification process, we saw in the diagram the outer wall is thinner and sloped toward the top, and this uh, inner wall uh, densifies into this small high aspect ratio needle. And we can look at the dynamics of the process uh, using uh, the environmental SEM. And so now we're looking uh, top down on a single ring, so it's an annulus like so, as we're condensing isopropanol onto the structure and then evaporating. And what you'll see is that there's some densification, the wall gets thinner when we condense the liquid. This is just by increasing the vapor pressure inside the ESEM chamber. But most of the motion happens as we evaporate the solvent, and now you see the wall coming in tilted. So the final structure looks, looks, looks something like this. And the wrinkles uh, that you see uh, occur uh, in large part because of the crust at the top, and also because of kind of these folding instabilities that happen as you shrink materials. But it shows not only how the, the, the local mechanical conditions are important in terms of the formation of the wrinkles, but it's really kind of the global coupling of the structure that causes it to tilt inward, uh, like you see. And uh, this idea that uh, by patterning a certain shape, growing the nanotubes and densifying them uh, is, is a way to control 3D shape lets you do some interesting patterning experiments. For example, make structures of different shapes at the same time, which is another thing that's difficult to do in parallel microfabrication processes. So uh, sticking with the, the thin rings of nanotubes or the, you know, the, the, the hollow cylinders, we can make arrays of sloped uh, kind of microwell features. And you can see in this picture that uh, each row was meant to be the same, uh, but each column was meant to be different. So we've preserved fairly well the, uh, the similarity and the heterogeneity among the features. And thick walls stay more vertical because you have more elastic resistance to the capillary forces. But as you decrease the wall thickness of the initial nanotube structure, the eventual tilt angle, if you measure it as a theta from the vertical axis to the base of the structure, increases. And in fact, at, the, at a certain limit, you go from having a tilted structure to a flat structure corresponding to what we believe is a buckling instability in that thin wall. But this is a way to control the final angle of the structures uh, by this geometric uh, control. And then you can do things like pattern overhanging structures starting with you know, two concentric cylinders. And the fact that this wall overhangs that one really tells me that the liquid is confined within the nanotube network. And if you exploit the two limits, you can make structures that combine horizontal texture with vertical texture. So this is a sheet of uh, radially aligned nanotubes that surrounds this vertical needle, which is uh, stiffer and doesn't collapse or buckle over under the capillary forces. 
so that's a you know remains an example of of the, of the circular that you could say you know uh, azimuthally symmetric structures, and if we look at the uh, semi semi cylindrical or asymmetric structures, we can learn about the bending that occurs. And so we start out with a forest that looks like this half cylinder, and after uh, the densification process, it, it is much thinner and it's deflected to the side. And uh, looking at a lot of pictures forced us to think about the mechanism behind this bend, behind this deflection. And uh, more qualitatively, what we think is happening is that uh, you know there's a tendency to minimize elastic energy as the nanotubes are brought together under the under the influence of capillary forces. And if you want to minimize elastic energy of a shrinking structure, all the nanotubes want to go toward the centroid. And for a half circle, the centroid is 4 r over 3 pi from this straight edge. However, uh, so, that, so that's good. However, uh, because the nanotubes are aligned and also kind of woven and interconnected with one another, if you try to pull all the nanotubes toward the centroid or toward this, this centroid line, the nanotubes below are going to pull down on the upper portion of the structure. So if this residual tension, this stretch gradient on the upper portion of the structure that causes the structure to bend. So there are both lateral forces introduced by a capillary densification, just the pure shrinkage, and there are axial forces pulling down on the upper part of the structure that cause it to deflect to the side. And then based on this principle, if you go from, for example, a solid half circle, a D, to a hollow half circle, a C, you can once again control the angle of the beams. Uh, and these are experiments where, you know, this is one substrate, so we've just patterned different features, and you can fabricate features with different angles at the same time. Uh, however, this bottom picture and this top picture are exactly the same pattern. And we found that in some experiments, they go one way, and in other experiments, they go the other way. And we believe this relates to the density of the nanotube forest the amount of slip that can occur between the nanotubes within the forest. If the density is lower, then there's more slip, and therefore you have less coupling among the vertical part of the structure. And this related simply to the growth fluctuations that I described before, which in fact are a bit more pronounced when you have pattern structures because you have less catalyst to deal with. So we built a <laughs> mathematical model that tried to describe these uh, lateral forces and vertical forces working with Professor Wei Lu, our collaborator at Michigan and his group. And basically, uh, the bottom line is that the lateral forces of densification cause the structure to want to move in to the left, whereas the axial forces that pull on the upper portion of the structure cause it to want to go to the right or toward the bent uh, half circle. So by manipulating this balance of forces and the amount of slip, among the structures, we can control the tilt angle of our nanotube microbeams. But when things work well and we have the same feature, it's possible to make these structures over fairly large areas, and you can make uh, nice and uniform arrays, and our capability is enhanced by having a chamber where we can control the temperature and pressure of condensation. All of these pictures were made with a beaker, but that difference between the immersion process, the sort of capillary coupling, in the condensation process, the capillary forming is very profound. If we look at this starting shape, starting arrangement with uh, these kind of flower-like patterns of half circles, if you dip it in solvent and evaporate it, this is the direction we immersed it in. The pillars are sort of smeared off to the sides, so you make a real mess. But if you condense and evaporate the solvent, then you can preserve the tendency of each structure to go in its own individually determined direction. You know, the ones with the half circles facing outward go outward, and the ones with the half circles facing inward go inward. And along similar lines, then, we can use combinations of these building blocks to make multi-directional architecture. So things that have, you know, re-entrant structures that may be very difficult to make using traditional microfabrication methods, let alone the fact that, you know, they're made out of nanotubes and that you could exploit the properties of nanotubes in a productive way. So half circles that face inward can be designed to form this kind of truss structure, which could be a mechanically useful structure or some kind of sensing structure based on the contact among the beams at the tip. These are also grown on patterned electrodes so we can measure the electric resistivity across the bridge. And if you flip the circles to the outside, then the structures bend in the other direction. Uh, based on this bending principle and the inward densification principle, we had the idea that we might be able to design a shape to twist 
and, uh, and uh, with some luck that, uh, that was fulfilled. Uh, so this shape, which is a composite of half circles and a larger thin walled circle, due to what I think is, is, is an instability as the structure densifies, shrivels up and forms a helix, or forms, forms a, forms a twisted microfilm. And all these are side by side on the same substrate, so we can imagine that uh, after the nanotube growth process, they were all the same height, but this one, because it's, because it's larger in diameter, it used up more of its height, more of the length of the nanotubes to twist up and therefore pull down farther. And the symmetry of the structures is, is fairly good, and uh, this is the smallest one, and you can see that they're twisted around a diameter of only a few microns. So, our approach was, you know, we, we kind of developed this step by step after we, we conceptualized the principle. Uh, so we became first interested in making the materials, making the structures, and now we're at the point of trying to explore different applications. And uh, we haven't developed many applications yet, but are motivated by some recent excellent literature that shows the potential of you know, anisotropic and multi-directional micro and nanostructures for creating new surface properties and new material properties. For example, it was shown by, uh, by, 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 by a few groups in the past years that slanted micro beams can be used to give surfaces anisotropic wetting properties. These are silicon nanopillars made of a Wang's group and MIT that were tilted in a certain direction by differential thermal expansion of a metal deposited on the surface. And they showed that with these slanted pillar arrays, liquids would spread preferentially in one direction because it's changing the surface energy and its anisotropy on the substrate. There's also, I believe, interesting applications in optical metamaterials and electromagnetic metamaterials in creating uh, you know, materials that can control the polarization of light. For example, this work from Germany, I believe, made beautiful gold helices by electrodeposition into a polymer film that was, uh, that was, that was uh, patterned by two-photon polymerization, and it showed that they can get uh, directional circular polarization uh, from an optical perspective. So we're not you know, anywhere near any of these specific applications, uh, but it's indeed motivation to understand the properties of our structures. But getting you know, back to more basics, of course, the nanotube structures we make are electrically conductive. And if you measure the electrical properties of a thin ring of nanotubes that's grown vertically and folded over, it's an anisotropic conductor. So we can take the nanotube film after we've done the densification back into the clean room and do simple lift-off patterning of metal on it, and we can measure the, radi the uh, electrical resistance, which should be R theta in the, uh, the, the direction around the ring, and compare it to the direction along the nanotubes, and there's an anisotropy in this structure about 20 to 1, and resistivity in the R direction along the nanotubes is about 20 times higher than the resistivity in the theta direction. So it's a conducting material, and it's also uniquely anisotropically conducting material, and it's anisotropically conducted in perhaps a unique direction. I don't know if there are many materials that have electrical conductivity and anisotropy in a radial and theta direction. Another uh, interesting basic property is the mechanical stiffness of these nanotube microfilms. And in fact, because of their low density, if you take an as-grown you know, cylinder of nanotube forest without densification, and do a simple compression test on it, you find it's very flimsy. It has a Young's modulus of maybe 50 megapascals or less, which is, uh, when it comes to you know, bulk microfabrication, uh, not very useful. However, after densification, after simply wetting and drying, the Young's modulus goes up by a factor of 100. So here you see data on uh, undensified as-grown forests compared to a densified or capillary-formed nanotube forest, uh, which shows this increase measured by the slope of the unloaded curve from 50 megapascals to 5 gigapascals. And then, after the nanotubes have been densified, they're sufficiently robust against liquid processing that then we can fill them with polymers simply by spin coating. So you take an array of densified nanotube pillars and, and pool SU8 or PMMA or other polymers onto the surface, spin it up at a high speed, get rid of the residual polymer, and polymer will remain trapped inside the nanotube pillar. So you've created an aligned nanocomposite pillar, which then has mechanical stiffness, Young's modulus higher than the densified nanotube pillar. So now we're at a modulus of 20 or 25 GPA in these experiments, which is nowhere near things like conventional microfabrication metals or even silicon, but significantly higher than typical microfabrication polymers. And I'll suggest that by you know, understanding the real organization and density of the nanotubes and perhaps exploring other polymers and 
and other matrix materials, it should be possible to increase the mechanical properties and study things you know, like elastic energy storage and damping, which are all interesting directions for us. So I'll close by talking about a couple kind of mini applications of these structures. And one is the use of uh, these nanotube microstructures as master molds for production of polymer structures. So typically, uh, if you want to make, for example, estimated microfillers, you can use deep exposure using a high energy source, or you can replicate the, the, the SU8 against a silicon master template. Well, what we've done is we've shown that the nanotube pillars themselves, after densification, can act as master molds for polymer replication. It's a very straightforward process. Uh, we just grow the nanotube pillars, we densify them using the condensation method, and then we infiltrate them with SU8 to form these composites. So now you have an array of SU8 nanotube composite microfillers. And then just by casting PDMS, onto the nanotube pillar and casting SU8 uh, into the PDMS negative, we can create a copy of the nanotube SU8 composite master. And you'll see higher resolution pictures in a moment, but it perhaps is an alternative technology for forming robust master molds for polymer microfabrication. It comes from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And, uh, and, and after we study, although the process is straightforward, after we understood the correct you know, spin coating positions and SU8 viscosity and things like that, we're able to make the substance structures fairly uniformly over large areas, even with different sizes and spacings between. And that's a picture of a chip that's about 15 millimeters across with different arrays. So one thing that may be interesting, or at least is preserved in this replication process, is not only the microscale form of the structures, but the nanoscale texture. So even though we've densified the nanotube forest and we've infiltrated with polymer, you still have uh, aligned texture on the sidewalls and you have this tangled crust texture on the top. So if you zoom in close in the SEM, you see that the tangled crust is, looks very similar from the master to the replica. This is the first replica R1 made from the first negative. And the aligned texture of the sidewall is close. And just to see how far it goes, we did a 25-fold study where we made five replicas of the first negative and then five negatives from the master and then did five replicas of that. And so we've gone out five-fold in two directions of fabrication and you can see that the structures look fairly close. And these are pictures of the same identical pillar at each stage of the process. And if you look, for example, using atomic force microscopy at the texture, uh, the surface roughness is comparable we can see a distinct difference between the top of the pillar and the sidewall of the pillar. So the top of the master is fairly, you know, this bumpy texture, and the top of the replica is also a bumpy texture, and the sidewalls agree like so. We haven't been able to compare exactly the same areas, and it does appear that there is some at the nanoscale inability of the replica to fill the small crevices in the master. But certainly, as others have shown in terms of the fidelity of polymer replication, it should be possible to to achieve truly nanoscale fidelity uh, using replication of perhaps even things attached to the nanotube surface. And to close this example, uh, one way that we might be able to take advantage of the nanotube master mold technology is to make high aspect ratio features. Because if you want to make high aspect ratio features, you need a master mold that has good mechanical robustness. And one way to make high aspect ratio features using our process is to make what we call a honeycomb. And that's to grow a nanotube forest that's uh, you know, a, a, an array of cylindrical holes in a forest. So this is just the catalyst pattern. And then when we densify them, it forms a honeycomb. So the areas between each hole shrink up. And then because of the you know, elastic stability of it, you get what looks like a micro you know, a, a honeycomb in a beehive. And we can then infiltrate this honeycomb with SU8, and we can then replicate it and create a copy. And starting out with walls that are five microns across, after densification, the walls are shrunken to uh, a few hundred nanometers. This is about 500 nanometers, and we can replicate thin walls that have aspect ratios about 50 to 1. So that's maybe at the limit of a high aspect ratio replication and master mold techniques that are done with high intensity exposure. So the last example, uh, which is more recent, uh, is, is motivated by an interest in making active materials, and perhaps inspired by the fact that the densification process itself is a transformation involving taking loosely packed filaments and bringing them together. Well, what might happen if we could then reverse the process and expand the filaments out even just a little bit? And there are many examples of this in natural systems. 
uh, for example, pine cones respond to the humidity, to the moisture content. And when uh, it's wet outside, the pine cone is closed up and looks like the top picture. When it's dry outside, the pine cone is open and you know is exposing its, its little leaves. And uh, in a lot of plants, the bottom line is that this relates to how the, the filaments in the plant cells and in the plant cell walls swell and contract as they're hydrated and dehydrated. So what if we could implement a similar mechanism using our nanotube structures? And as a first uh, demonstration is really a proof of concept, we sought to uh, fabricate composite microstructures of nanotubes and moisture responsive hydrogels. A hydrogel is a gel that shit swells in response to a stimulus such as moisture, or pH, or temperature, depending on the gel chemistry. And we took our same process to grow hollow nanotube cylinders to densify them. And then instead of spinning in S weight as before, we spun in a hydrogel. And because of this capillary selectivity, we end up with what I'll call a nanotube iris, which is a composite of the lion nanotubes and hydrogel. And the guiding principle is that if you had just a block of hydrogel and you swelled it, it would swell isotropically. So it would get bigger in all three dimensions. But if you had a, a nanotube forest that was filled with hydrogel, then the anisotropic mechanical properties of the nanotube forest would direct the swelling to be anisotropic. So you could expand the material in the lateral direction selectively, and then that could maybe transform some of our microstructures. So we've only been successful so far with a simple example, and that takes us back to the hollow structure uh, in the ESEM. But we're not watching densification now. Now this has been infiltrated with uh, moisture responsive hydrogel, and now we're controlling the vapor pressure of water and increasing the water vapor pressure and seeing the structure expand, and then decreasing the water vapor pressure and seeing the structure contract. And so we've been able to impart some responsive character, which is, you know, as far as we can test in the SEM, it exists for a large number of cycles. And you can even see that the wrinkles that exist in the initial structure are returned in the final structure. So both the local and global mechanical coupling exists. And I think there could be you know, interesting dynamics because of the aligned texture of the fiber network if we did experiments that uh, tried to measure the response time. The response time of plant actuators is known to depend uh, inversely on the link scale. The smaller the link scale of fluid transport, the faster the actuation. It's also a you know, difference between different types of plant actuators that operate by swelling or operate by mechanical instabilities like the Venus flytrap. So we've indeed made this well reverse its shape. So now you see static pictures of different structures. This one we loaded with so much water that you get droplets on the substrate, and it goes from dry to being closed, wet being open, and to dry being closed again. You can see the wrinkles come back. And if we take a similar structure and we cross-section it using the focused ion beam, you can see that we've created a, this composite wall. And in fact, we probably trapped a little hydrogel in the base here. So there's some hydrogel, residual hydrogel contained in the base, and then otherwise we formed a nicely confined aligned nanotube gel composite. And we measured a large number of structures and uh, we can coarsely predict the amount of motion based on a finite element model, uh, which is based on an anisotropic expansion. So you build one of these rings in a finite element model and expand the elements laterally. And then by expanding the elements laterally, the whole shape will swell like we saw in the experiment. And it shows that in principle, based on the simulation, if you were able to control the amount of swelling, then you can control the actuation stroke of the structures. Uh, and the black the dots uh, you know, kind of overlap the whole range of data, and that relates to geometric irregularities in the area of structures we tested. But for example, we've confirmed the ability to get, say, 20 or 30 percent stroke if the stroke is measured based on the chain between the inner diameter while dry and while wet. So a large stroke actuation using this principle of directed swelling uh, should be possible if we can, uh, if we can more rigorously implement the idea. And my last slide will show uh, a, a preliminary example of, of integration of this principle in, in a simple a micro sensor. And what we did was take uh, our you know, ring of semicircular pillars that is designed to come together and form a bridge and pattern it on an array of electrodes uh, that are compatible with the growth process. So we grow them on titanium nitride electrodes uh, and then we can make electrical contact to each foot of the bridge uh, after growth. 
And then we infiltrated the structure with hydrogel, and we measured the change in the electrical resistance as the structure is wet and dry. And by the swelling and, and or the hydration and dehydration of the, of the apex of the bridge of the gel, we were able to measure a fairly rapid change in the electrical resistance across the apex of the bridge. So when the structure is wet, the network at the top is swelled apart, and the resistance is higher, and when it's dry, uh, the nanotubes are closer together and the resistance is lower. We can repeat this over a few cycles as well. This was an experiment done quite crudely where we were just flooding the air, the, this, the sample with a drop of water and withdrawing it back. So a lot of residual water behind, but when we were taking data just at the frequency of one second, the sensor responded almost to its steady state value within the duration of one second. So perhaps if uh, if we can combine art and science uh, with some more creative fabrication, we might be able to make active microstructure that respond like the flowers in this picture, which at this point are just a fun art project. Uh, and that's the end, and I just want to thank lots of great, hardworking students at Michigan who, who did all the work. Uh, Eric and Mostafa, who worked on nanotube growth, and Sam and Michael and Dalbor and Sejin, who've done the 3D structures. Ryan, who's building the uh, Robo Furnace. Desiree, who's our collaborator from MIT and Mount Holyoke, we did the chemical analysis of growth mechanisms and uh, funding uh, here mainly from NSF, Michigan, and ONR. And thank you for listening. Excellent. Uh, I guess we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Have you spent any time trying to remove the top crust? Yes, by plasmation. By oxygen plasmation? By oxygen plasmation. And in fact, that affects densification because the crust has you know, in-plane stiffness. And if you take the crust off, the features densify more and, in fact, bend more or collapse. And so, they, and, and the crust etches away quickly in O2? Uh, I don't have a good etch rate, but it etches fairly well. And in fact, not only do you etch, you etch it, but you can, in fact, like penetrate down into the forest, so you can introduce strange density yeah, gradients and edge the sides away. How does, it, away how does and so it affect the forest itself? Actually? If we edge for too long of a time, then we can we actually start to eat away the outside. Okay. We honestly haven't done an in-depth study yet. We have like our condition and plasma, yeah. and temperature, and you know pressure and time that gives a good etch rate, and we use that. And have you looked at uh, electrical resistance from top to bottom as uh, with or without the crust? With and the crust, we haven't done that, no. But it's, but it's useful, and also we haven't even measured like forests of different heights where we get this density to take. But that would be a very nice experiment also. So. So I was intrigued by your, your loading and unloading costs. I don't know if I was reading the graph correctly, yep. but you actually had a lot of hysteresis in your densified There is, yes. yes. I was a little surprised by that. I mean, so, so, so. Again, you know, this is you know, sort of a first experiment, but I think a lot of the hysteresis occurs because of the base, which which kind of folds and crumbles or buckles in, uh, and that is responsible for sort of the plastic energy that you see under the curve. There's also a fair amount of elastic recovery, but the base is, I think, a limiting aspect of this design. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I missed one, but because there are examples, but do you anticipate that any of these structures might be electroactive in the sense that you could bring an electric field somehow to change their shape? Yeah, I think they should be. Like, you could imagine electrostatically actuating yeah. in one of the tilted structures. Yeah. Um, this may be a really simplistic question, but so do you understand the mechanism for the de-densification at the bottom, and why don't you have additional initiation of sites that might prop it up and keep it going? So, so you mean the, the, the decrease in density during growth? During growth. So, yeah. so what we think is happening is it's the individual catalyst particles deactivate, and depending on the conditions, the catalyst particles can become coated with like hydrocarbon byproducts from the atmosphere, or if the substrate, the alumina layer, which is under the catalyst, is sufficiently porous, iron can actually diffuse down into the substrate. So, it, the, the like the roles of those different mechanisms can depend on the conditions you use, but it's basically accumulated deactivation of individual particles. So we've done further work where we've mapped the density with higher spatial resolution using X-ray absorption, and then we can get 
a real, you know, it's not just this, this sudden drop, but it's a smooth curve of the number of nanotubes versus time, and it fits very well, like an exponential decay in the number of active catalyst particles. So I just close it with a couple of questions. Uh, first, I see a lot of opportunity here for sensing. Mm -hmm. So um, what are some of the ideas that you may have for, for sense ideas? And then the second thing is, what other three-dimensional structures do you think of making using this technique? So for sensing, I mean, the basic contrary is coding the nanotubes with other things that might increase their surface area or their functionality. That's one area where I think there's, there's some opportunity. Another area is contact between different structures, like the bridge principle that we saw. So I would say exploiting that in, in ways that might be able to make the contact sensitive to a particular stimulus. Other three-dimensional structures. We've kind, of, we've kind of stopped and are trying to use what we have now. But, but we can iterate the process. So you can grow and densify. And then you can put the same substrate back in the furnace and, and, and get the catalyst going again and grow a little more and then densify again. So you can make things that are like springs. Yeah. So that's, that's another type of three structure. Excellent. Let's thank our speaker again. Stick around, especially our students, if you want to talk to him. Uh, this is the opportunity to do so. Thank you.